Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How are y'all doing? Good to see everybody here today. Um, <clears throat> I had the pleasure of teaching last week. Um, I got some compliments. I'll, I thank I thank you for that. Um, I uh, I hadn't taught Bible class in probably three or four years, so it was it's good to be back. Um, and today we're going to continue our lesson. Let's see if this will work here. Well, that's that. Okay. Um, on um, knowing and receiving God's promises. Um, we didn't get through it all last week, so I've got a, a little bit here at the beginning that we can uh, recap on. Um, and any thoughts that we have? Um, let's see if I can make it work. There we go. Okay. So if you remember, we talked about the withered fig tree and how the disciples were so astonished at that. Uh, it was a powerful lesson for them. Um, <clears throat> I think it, it is for us too today um, because that was the tree that was in full leaf, but it didn't bear any fruit. And Jesus cursed it for that. Um, there are other scriptures that talk about fruit and trees and talk about fig trees even. I did encounter this one as I was studying for a lesson today. In Luke 6, 43, uh, he talks about um, basically no good tree bears bad fruit, uh, nor does a bad one bear good fruit. Um, each tree is recognized for its own fruit. Uh, and he makes the analogy there of us bearing good fruit in our lives that's coming from the good within us. Uh, but there is a, a, a caution that um, at, at the you know at the end at the judgment day the the trees that aren't bearing good fruit are going to be uh, thrown into the fire. So just something to be cautious of uh, and and to uh, realize that God wants us bearing fruit in our lives and and in our church. Um, we talked about prayer and we'll talk a little more about prayer today. Uh, it can be simple. Um, it can be very, very powerful through faith that uh, the mountain can be thrown into the sea, which may stand for the greatest burden you think you have in your life. God can help you overcome that. Um, and it's always something that's a request, that God has the power. Uh, it, it, we don't have the power. It's through Christ uh, and God. Um, there were two, uh, two things in our lesson last week that... Uh, Jesus talked about as being important or crucial for effective prayer. Uh, one of those is that believing, you're believing that you have received God's blessings and what you're asking for in the present tense, not in the future tense. The second is to forgive others so that, that we can be forgiven. Uh, that, that seems to be a theme throughout several of Jesus' teachings and, uh, and prayers. Um, the last point is that uh, we need to be praying in the name of Christ because Christ is uh, who is our intermediary with God. Uh, also, that is the authority by which uh, God will honor those requests. Um, and we'll study today a little bit about God's will and how that plays in with, with our prayer life. Okay. Well, new content on prayer. Um, think of ways Jesus prayed and what manner and where uh, he did that. Um, I think sometimes we're taught to pray, you know, a certain time of day in a certain way, right? Well, there's lots of examples from Scripture. <clears throat> in Mark 1.35, he prayed very early while it was still dark in a solitary place. It says in Luke, he often withdrew to lonely places to pray, or he went up in the hills by himself in Matthew 14. He went on a mountaintop, and he prayed before the transfiguration. Um, he also prayed for children. People would bring children to him, and he would uh, pray for them. Um, he prayed in Luke 6, before he chose the disciples, uh, 12 apostles, he prayed all night long, Scripture records. Um, on the night before his betrayal uh, by Judas and before he was taken uh, and crucified, he prayed in anguish, right, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, 
And then Mark and, and uh, Matthew record the, the cleansing of the temple, which we talked about last week. Uh, he did pray, and he mentioned prayer. He said, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. That's, that's his objective uh, for his holy temple. Um, now, how can we pray? What, how do we physically do it? Um, well, what we see in Luke 22 is the example of Christ um, kneeling in the garden. Um, in Matthew 26, he was prone, face down in the garden. Now that, that was a serious prayer. That was a prayer for his physical life to be spared, uh, crucifixion on the cross. Uh, in John 17, it said he was looking up into heaven. Um, in Luke 18, he was standing or it mentioned someone standing, looking down in humility or repentance. And then in 1 Kings 8, you see Solomon's prayer. He was standing and he was lifting holy hands. Uh, that was his posture. So all different ways we can pray. No one specific way. I guess it depends on the situation. Um, now, let's go to a scripture here that um, talks a little more, reinforces a little bit what we talked about. In 1 John 5, verse 14, uh, Apostle John writes, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the reassurance we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. A little bit complicated there, <laughs> but <clears throat> I guess just looking at that passage, there's, there's just few verses there. Let's see what we can pick out about uh, what Jesus is teaching there, or what John is, is teaching us about uh, God's will for our, our prayers. So how should we approach God? What does that scripture tell us? Humility, great. Okay. Okay. And okay, so the question is, how should we pray today in, in terms of our posture? Which of those is most appropriate for today? Good. I don't have the answer, but <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's a, that's a good scripture. Pray without ceasing. Right. In fact, many times, I think a prayer could be just a simple, just, you know, as you go along, you see something, you know, thank you, Lord, for this. Lord, I need help with it. You know, sure. We should, you know, we should have times where we plan and we, we can pick our posture and stuff. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. So just kind of summarizing for those online, um, really the pray without ceasing means not just I've got planned times of prayer, but as I go throughout my day, there's many opportunities in which I could pray for Thanksgiving, for somebody who needs help, uh, other examples. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Yes. When you're by yourself, no one else around you think it's necessary to actually say the word or can you go through the prayer in your mind? Okay, so this is a, a good thought. Like when, when you're actually by yourself and you're praying, um, must we go through more of the, the full ritual, I guess, if you want to call it that, of, of our prayer we might do at, in public or with others? Um, I think God will accept you know, your prayers based on your faith, right? Um, maybe you, you can't, you're praying so deep and hard that the best you can do is, is to say, say certain words, right? That, that's one answer. I don't know any other thoughts there. Yes. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, good example of Hannah praying in, in the temple with the mouths moving, but no words being uttered. Um, and, and she was thought to be crazy <laughs> by the priests in the temple, but she was praying in her mind. Yes, okay, good. Yes. Great, okay. So coming in confidence with boldness with our petitions for God. Jesus gave some parables about that, about, you know, if you're not going to turn someone away if they're knocking persistently at night. Um, or who's going to give a man, you know, was it the fish? If they ask for bread, vice versa. Yeah, that God is uh, hearing our prayers. I think that's part of this answer here. And also it talked about coming, um, right? <clears throat> if we ask him anything according to his will, I think that's a key part of our prayer. We don't always know what his will is, but um, through Bible study, right, through prayer, through interaction with our fellow Christians, you know, maybe we have better better understanding of what God's will is for a situation, right? I saw a hand in the back. Okay. Great, okay, and I've got that scripture coming up, but perfect uh, example of how we may not know what to pray in a situation. <clears throat> we may feel the situation, and the Holy Spirit can help us. So we'll get to that in a minute. All right, so I think we've got a lot of good answers there. Um, what assurance do we have about God uh, answering our prayers? Or at least in praying, what assurances do we have? Okay. Great. Okay. So the history of not just our you know, own personal life, but also biblically, right? We see the evidence of God working in our lives and other people's lives, in the lives of those uh, in, in Holy Scripture. Great. Yes. Right. Okay, so the, the I, uh, question was, you've got the Lord's Prayer versus more of a spontaneous prayer. Uh, what are the thoughts there on, on which is more appropriate? I think that... The, you know, the disciples came to Jesus and said, how should we pray? And that, the Lord's Prayer is what he said, pray like this. But we see from Scripture, and we'll go through some of these here in just a second, uh, there were other prayers that Jesus gave that were of different varieties. And so I think of the, the Lord's Prayer as, as more of the, you know, the daily, the daily life prayer, Right? But there's many other things you can certainly pray about. Uh, I think God wants to hear our prayers, right? About the concerns we have, because it's about the relationship with God. Okay? There's a lot of elements in this in the Lord's Prayer. To approach, to approach God, He's holy, so mm -hmm. hallowed be your name, that, that we're, He's the Father, we have assurance in, in all yes. the in those families. There, there is a, a confidence there, but we also that assurance forgive us as we forgive others you know there's we want that as human beings and that assurance is there when we pray he's going to forgive us yes okay so two elements we've just mentioned here by reggie is as the the holiness of god and recognizing his all-powerful nature uh, but also humbling ourselves through forgiving others and recognizing that everyone has faults we all need forgiveness, and so by forgiving others uh, who've trespassed against us, um, you know, we're in a, a better position for God to forgive our, our, our failings. Great. Okay. Let's jump on. Um, should we bring our request to God if we're not sure what the answers may be? Okay. 
Okay. And that he will answer us in the way that's best for us. So no matter what we ask, we can be assured that he will answer us in the best way. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we, we may not get the answer we like um, from a prayer, but God is looking out for our best interests uh, and what we need. That's, that's a great answer. Um, do we have, you know, the, the Lord's Prayer is fairly basic, you know, in the sense of the major elements uh, that we should try to incorporate in any prayer, right? Um, but what about when we have challenges in our life um, that we don't know the answer to? We don't know what to ask for, right? Should we pray anyway? Yes. One of the things that's always in my mind sometimes is that number one, God has placed us in this world and we're subject to the laws of physics and all the other things in this world. If you go spin on the yes. track long enough, you're going to get run over. Yep. Okay, but at the same time, we pray for things to happen and ask God to intervene against these principles. Save us from this. Save us from that. Don't let this happen. Uh, so somewhere there's God's will in that way has to be fulfilled, and in the other way, there's the answer to our prayer in a certain way, and so it's hard to understand, as has been pointed out, you know, you pray for something, uh, and something bad happens, like you pray for safety on a journey, and you wind up mm -hmm. in a car wreck, you know, and you say, well, God, why didn't you protect me, you know, and so we start blaming God for things that we prayed for, we thought he was going to give us, and it didn't happen. Okay. Because we're still subject to other laws of, of that he has put in place, that it's his will that we be subjected to those laws. Okay, so Charlie points out that there's, <clears throat> there is a law of nature at work, and God did create this world um, for more than just us as individuals. Um, I know we like to think otherwise sometimes, <laughs> but um, there can be bad things that happen to good people, and, and although we may pray a certain way, it, it, the world may intervene. Um, you know, I think about um, Job in that situation and how Satan came to God and said, I see your servant, um, I'd like to test him, basically. And so God allowed that to be done, right? Um, and so um, that's the subject of another Bible lesson, I think. <laughs> but, but very good thoughts there, yes. I love the verse, uh, the next verse, verse 27. Okay. Ah, uh, okay. Sure. Okay, so God searches our heart, uh, which is a follow-on scripture, um, to Romans eight twenty-six, um, and the Spirit does help us through interceding. All right, let's see. Let's look at that. Let's, let's look at a couple of verses here because I, I want to make sure we get to lesson six. <laughs> but um, great thoughts, everybody. Um, so Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, as, as you may recall, he was praying so intently that it said that he, he uh, had tears of blood coming from his forehead, right? Um, we see in Matthew 26, 39... Uh, in that situation, it says, going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. <clears throat> I think he goes back and finds the disciples asleep. He wakes them up and challenges them. Then he goes back and prays again. He went away a second time and prayed, my father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away from me, unless I drink it, may your will be done. So, there are situations where God needs us to do something, to be part of something, to go through something, uh, a trial of some kind. And uh, in, in Christ's situation, obviously, he, our sins would not be forgiven were he not that perfect sacrifice for us, which he knew, but yet he still prayed to have it taken from him, which, which tells you the humanity uh, and, and the terrible sacrifice that it really was for him right, uh, is, is to know that he's going to experience that and to willingly go through it. In, in Romans 8, 26, uh, it reads, as been mentioned, um, 
In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. So I think we're thankful for that, right? I think God wants us to come to him and to pray to him uh, through faith uh, and, and through Christ with, uh, with our lives as closely as we can, aligning ourselves to our Messiah and Savior, to Jesus and what uh, the example that he followed, uh, the example that he, he led that we follow. Okay, let's move on. Um, today we're going to be in Matthew 6, so if you've got your Bibles, you can follow along. Um, we're going to be kind of setting the stage here uh, as Jesus was teaching the masses. He had called his 12 disciples, um, and it's kind of interesting, I actually, I, maybe I didn't know this uh, or forgotten it, but there's the Sermon on the Mount that we know, the Beatitudes of uh, Matthew 5 through 729. But Luke records what's called the Sermon on the Plain. It's very similar. Um, in the Sermon on the Mount, it said he, he saw the crowds and he went up on the mountainside and sat down. Um, on the Sermon on the Plain, he went down with them and stood at a level place. I just thought that was interesting. Um, perhaps two different events um, recorded uh, by Matthew and Luke there. But what's key there is that Jesus starts out with the with what we call the Beatitudes. There's several promises that he gives there, right? Um, there's also not just blessings, but there's woes. There's things that if you don't uh, live your life, if you don't have your life aligned spiritually, that uh, negative things will happen eventually. Um, and the author of the lesson that we're studying from here pointed out that he sees this as the contrast between sort of uh, the time-bound nature that we all have on this earth versus that spirit-filled uh, nature of, of life, eternity-bound life, if you will. Um, they're difficult to follow, really. Uh, they're difficult to live up to and achieve. Um, but I think we know them. This is Luke's version. We normally study Matthew's version. Um, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Um, blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Um, but, Jesus says, when that happens, rejoice, right? Rejoice in that day. Uh, and leap for joy in that time of persecution, because great is your reward in heaven. Uh, for that is how their fathers treated the prophets. Sort of that analogy, right, if you look at the Old Testament and the way the prophets were treated by the nation of Israel, often um, the true prophets, they experienced all those things. So this is sort of a sign uh, that, you know, God's on your side if you're experiencing these things through persecution because of Jesus' name. Um, then he goes into the woes. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well-fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak evil of you, for that is how their father treated the false prophets. Um, so... Examples of things not to aspire to. <laughs> Just because you're rich, well-fed, uh, laughing, times are wonderful, and everyone says you're, you're wonderful, that doesn't mean that you're aligned to God's will and to Jesus, right? Um, well, if we kind of decompose this um, a little bit um, into some specifics, Jesus over in Matthew 6 uh, has something here that says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Um, this is a challenging scripture, I think, for all of us you know, that live in the United States of America. For the most part, we're the wealthiest nation on earth. 
And um, we, we do worry about these things even, even so, right? Um, I think uh, with, with all the physical blessings we have, it's very difficult not to worry about your next meal, worry about the clothes you're going to wear. I'm sure we all thought about that before we even came to church today, right? It's like, well, well what am I going to wear? Um, there are some other translations of this that's kind of interesting because it, in King James, uh, he says, take no thought for your life. In the New Revised Standard, do not worry about your life. The New Living is do not worry about your everyday life. Uh, the English Standard is do not be anxious about your life. Uh, Wymouth had a, a little bit different one. Do not be over anxious about your lives. I guess it allowed some anxiety. Uh, and Wycliffe was that ye be not busy to your life. So I think there's been different interpretations of this. And through time, right, uh, the different challenges in different societies people faced, uh, maybe you looked at this a different way, perhaps. Um, now, it's worth noting here that you know, poverty is a very real thing. Um, you know, not just in the United States, but I looked up some data. I kind of like uh, our, you know, our World in Data is a really neat website that just gives you all the statistics. And <clears throat> most of these graphs don't even have the United States on them. <laughs> so they're looking at other places in the world, right, where the poverty is, is greater and looking at the trend of that coming down. Uh, Africa has the greatest poverty level. Um, this author uh, basically said that, you know, two centuries ago, the general thought was it's never going to get any better. But we've seen dramatically, you know, over 200 years, how much poverty has reduced. Um, and, but it's still a shocking number here of people that are living on less than $2 a day. That's, that's, that's the most income that they have is $2 a day. It's 9% of our world's population in 2018. That's a very high number. There are a lot of people that are worried about their next meal, right? Um, but there's a trend of it going down. That's wonderful. Um, I know there's folks out there that this is a big part of, you know, how they, uh, you know, work in the world is to try to reduce that poverty. Um, Let's look at anxiety. I think we've all been through a lot of anxiety with the pandemic. Um, this, this chart shows that, uh, you know, for everyone, men, men less so than women somehow, um, but in the age groups here, as you, as you passed your 20s, there was a significantly larger anxiety level, according to The Economist and the data that they used. Um, also, depression uh, markedly greater depression. Um, so I think we've all suffered through that and um, understand those impacts. So maybe this scripture starts to make a little sense here <laughs> to us, um, and we can see that. Well, Christ continues on, um, and he talks about how God takes care of his creation, uh, just as an example. Uh, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they are? And then he says, Who among you can, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Other translations say a single cubit to his height or his stature. Um, we might have a little more insight into how to improve or prolong our life just through physical activity and diet, and I think we're all doing that. Um, but there's not much we can do about our height. So we can get high heels. Uh, they can stretch our spine. Beyond that, that's, you're, you are who you are, right? You can't change that uh, about yourself. Um, and he says, why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. Um, we've definitely seen the wonderful spring growth coming out of flowers and trees. Everything's really green this year. Um, maybe the freeze helped or we did get a lot of rainfall, but you can definitely see God at work and you know, just nature around us right now. And it is spectacular uh, 
you know, the way a flower can grow, the way something can just suddenly turn green. Um, truly amazing. Um, but, you know, God contrasts here. Um, if that's how God closed the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Um, o ye of little faith. So here... Um, Jesus is really kind of ranking the order of creation, right? Um, the, kind of the lowest would be the grass and the birds, you know, are a little more sophisticated organism. Um, but we're way up here. It still says, you know, we're, I guess the scripture says we're a little above the angels, right? Um, so God cares for us. God will provide for our needs. Um, so he admonishes, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough troubles of its own. Like every sentence is just, you know, a gold nugget in what Jesus is saying there, right? About how we should live our life. Um, so I did want to sort of uh, highlight a, a couple of things here, just to compare, just to show you what challenges we're up against here. <clears throat> um, I uh, hadn't read it yet, but every, every weekend, you know, I get the Wall Street Journal. I'm subscribed to the online version, okay? And I do read it pretty carefully because I like to, you know, provide for my family and prepare the nest egg and all those things, all right? <clears throat> Well, if you just look at the today, just this, this weekend's uh, articles, okay, NASDAQ caps worst month since 2008, uh, cost of paying workers rising, uh, Ukraine's resilience in war, Exxon's first quarter profit more than doubled. Okay, that may be one to go to. Um, Buffett faces winds of change. And then, you know, I love Jason's why, okay, squeezing more out of your safest assets. Um, and then... Uh, Jason Gay had an article about uh, if you are a brisk walker, you can add 16 years to your life. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, it's it basically we're assaulted continually. And, you know, we have in this, you know, our society, right, we're prosperous. <clears throat> but everything we're getting is sort of counter to Jesus's philosophy. Um, I, I mean, that is pretty bad down eight nine percent ten percent okay um well guess what they also have another insert in the same edition is how we should clothe ourselves for sunny escapes <laughs> so <clears throat> you know there is a worldly mindset that we have to be aware of and we're bombarded with it all the time um so it's refreshing to look in scripture and see you know what what's our true calling as christians right all right, let's, yes. Yes, yes. Thank you for those thoughts, Billy. Um, for the for those online, um, speaking about just how quickly we can go from one mindset to another, whereas um, you know each Sunday we're in you know in here with our brothers and sisters in Christ, you know maybe daily in our scriptures, but just in a second, right? We can revert back to thinking about the things of the world. That's what Satan wants us to do, right? And um, the anxiety, the depression, the other things in that worldly view that it brings, right, um, is, is not what God wants us to be focused on. Yes, sir. Well, it can spur you to do something about what you're worrying about. 
for instance, yes. if you have a daughter and she may be dating a young man that you feel she can't, she can't be trusted, mm -hmm. you'd be anxious about that and so you'd talk to her about it. Okay. So it can you do something well, about Well, I think you're on to my question here. <laughs> Are there any benefits to being anxious or worrying? And I think it, it, there are natural things we should be uh, worried about, which would be our loved ones and their spiritual health and their well-being is a good example. Any other examples of things we should be worried about? Okay. If it's really set on the kingdom, your worries and your anxiousness are going to go way down. Go Good way point. Down. Good point. Yeah. So. Well, the bigger it is, the yes. worried, the less time you're going to be focused on kingdom things. So the, the comment was that, yes, there are going to be things in this world that we're anxious about, that we worry about, but if our heart is centered on kingdom things, that that level of worry and anxiety will be way down, more manageable. Yes? I think also, um, when we worry, sometimes it's about maintaining the comfort level we've achieved. Ah, uh, okay. Sure. Right. Okay, in the back. Okay. Okay, good example. So there was the parable of the man who built his house in the wrong place on the sand versus the one that built it on the rocks and was knowing, right, that this is the safer place to put it. So the awareness uh, was, awareness and action replaced the worry in his situation. One of the yes. words I saw that they were talking about, worry or be distracted. And I thought about okay. Jesus' words. We get distracted, so he says, watch and pray. Ah, uh, okay. If, if we're not watching, we get distracted. I mean, you're Good point. going to get distracted if you're not okay. watching your life. So watching, watching and praying will help us avoid distraction. Okay, I think we've talked about number two, and I've heard some examples here of why not necessarily unchristian, to be worried about things as long as we're worried about the right things, perhaps. Is that the thought? Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So just as, as we go through experiences and in life and as we age, some things are going to be worried about differently than others. Okay. Well, we're running out of time. I think that was the last bell, but uh, I did have a few other questions. This is for your take-home assignments. Uh, what is the cause of worry or anxiety in this passage? Okay. Uh, how can we cure worry or anxiety? All right. Those were the... You guys can take that home. Um, and if we want to contrast this with the Christian perspective, here are some thoughts for you. Um, First of all, the Lord has promised to take care of our needs. Um, we're considered more valuable than the other parts of his creation, and we see him taking care of the other parts of his creation, no matter what mankind is trying to do <laughs> to destroy it. Um, and um, basically, anxiety and worry probably can't change the situation because God has a plan in motion. Um, God knows what we need, and he said, seek my kingdom first, right? And all these things will be added. So don't put the things of this life, the earthly things, before the kingdom things. Put the kingdom things first, and God says, I'll provide the other things to you. You don't need to worry about those. So I think that summarizes it. Um, with that, I appreciate you being here today. And... Uh, Hope you enjoy worship uh, today, and uh, we'll see you next week.
So thank you. Thank you.